All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. So this is our agenda for today. We're going to be um, talking about second opinion services in the works comp space. We'll talk about independent medical examinations, talk about some state-based considerations, and uh, we'll do a Q&A at the end. I would uh, encourage everyone to submit questions as they go along, and I'll try to uh, pepper them in throughout the, um, throughout the webinar. Um, so uh, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, panelists. Um, so we have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Seidner, uh, Paul Signolfi, Sarah Thomas, and Janice Van Allen. Dr. Seidner is Chief Medical Officer at the Hartford. Uh, he's former Global Medical Director for Travelers, and he's a board-certified physician. Uh, he's certified in preventive medicine, occupational environmental medicine, and he's a member of the American Board of Family Practice. Uh, Paul Signolfi is the Senior Managing Director at Amitros. He's a former Executive Director and Chairman of Maine Workers' Compensation Board, and he's a former partner at Rudman Winchell. And Sarah Thomas, she's a Senior Workers' Comp Compensation Attorney. Uh, she's Managing Partner at Jones & Jones. And Janice Van Allen is Senior Risk Management Executive. She is a former Senior Director of Risk Management at Walmart. She's won a number of awards, and in 2020, she was awarded with the Risk Professional of the Year. And myself, I have the privilege of moderating today's session. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Best in Class MD. We're an expert medical opinion company providing these expert medical opinion services as well as IMEs. I am a practicing orthopedic surgeon at the Hospital for Special Surgery, an associate professor at Wild Cornell Medical School, and um, I take care of a, a few professional sports teams as well. I'd also like to take a second to acknowledge our sponsor, uh, MedCall, who we have an exciting partnership with to um, extend the continuum of opinions available for injured workers in the workers' comp space. And so we'll, de we'll delve right into our agenda for today. Um, we're going to um, be talking about uh, second opinion um, services. And there are a number of different second opinion services that are available in the workers' compensation space. Um, it can be difficult with so many doctor touch points to really understand when you should be using each of these different options in the life of a claim. Um, the reality is, though, is that depending on your jurisdiction, for example, you might be mandated to use certain types of second opinions, and the injured worker may even ask for some of these. Um, so we've listed out here the second opinion services that are commonly used in workers' compensation. And I'll run through some of these definitions. So uh, utilization review, um, oftentimes done by a nurse um, with the use of established guidelines to ensure that the recommended treatments are medically necessary. And this can be escalated to a peer review, which is asynchronously done and oftentimes done by a physician. Um, and it's a simple medical record review where a question is asked about the medical care as well as the diagnosis. And uh, beyond this, there is the expert medical record review, um, which is a more detailed record review where uh, not only is a question asked, but there's an outline of a treatment plan provided, as well as potential diagnostic steps to get to the right uh, diagnosis. And then um, in the realm of telehealth, there's an expert comprehensive consultation, which is both a record review as well as a telehealth visit. And this is something that we uniquely provide at Best in Class, and that can involve combination of a number of stakeholders. It can incorporate the injured worker. It can also incorporate the local treating physician where there's a doctor to doctor video visit, as well as members of the case management team. And then we're all familiar with the idea of the independent medical examination. And this is a formal in-person consultation with a written report that is oftentimes used on litigated files. And then finally, there is um, the impairment rating, which is a formal application of the um, state jurisdiction impairment guides to assign a numerical value indicating the degree of permanent disability. And so it's very helpful to see how these services appear related to the life cycle of the claim. And this graphic highlights the life of a claim and how a claim can progress. In this graphic, it progresses from the left to the right. And oftentimes, based on jurisdiction, the utilization review may come first, or it may be mandated. Beyond that, there can be an escalation of the UR, or the claim can even go straight to peer review. And then further along in the claim timeline, there are a number of available tools depending on the claims team's goals. These can include a medical record review, 
a telehealth visit, and even an IME. And then towards the end of the claims lifecycle, you can pull in an impairment rating if needed. On one of our prior webinars, we unpacked impairment ratings in great detail and some of their issues. Um, and so we'll tread lightly on impairment ratings today. Um, and so um, I will uh, transition a little bit to asking um, some questions of our uh, panelists at this point. I've talked way too much. I time myself at five minutes and I talk for six minutes. So um, I'm going to pose a question to some of our panelists. So um, I'll start with you, Janice. Uh, what is the most um, common service that you use uh, when you were at Walmart? Good question and not really an easy answer. It kind of just depends on the context of each claim. Um, I'd say in terms of really helping adjusters determine the direction of a claim, IMEs, um, the IME reports receive probably the most discussion during claim reviews. Um, IME reports give us valuable insights on the claims, um, on the claimant's medical condition and help us assess the extent of injuries and disabilities. Uh, of course, that's essential in helping us move forward in a claim. Um, peer reviews and record reviews also are utilized quite frequently. But if we were just going from sheer frequency, just uh, in numbers, I would have to say URs are probably um, the most common service. You know, UR process uh, tends to be very transactional in nature, um, particularly in states where nearly every medical request is subject to UR scrutiny. That's very helpful, Janice. And yeah, exactly. I think based on the jurisdiction will dictate which service that you use most commonly. And so moving on to think a little bit about, you know, the national scope. And when you step back, you, you, you know, the reality is that um, a case can either be contested or, or accepted. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the, um, the statistics that you had provided to me, Dr. Seidner, is that 85% of workers' compensation cases nationally are accepted and 15% are uh, contested. Um, and so when we think about IMEs and uh, being used in contested cases, Dr. Seidner, what, what would you say is the percentage of IMEs that you are using on contested claims at the Hartford? No simple answer because the percent of claims with an IME depends on a number of factors. There's a range in those, you know, contested claims, anywhere from maybe the middle 75% is 10 to 50%, so almost half of them. Um, what I'd say is you need to look at claim characteristics. Is it a lost time claim or is there no lost time? Um, you know, is that person out of work? Is there a legal representation? Do they have an attorney or are they not represented? I think you also have to look at the state's jurisdictional dependencies, um, make a difference as to the utilization of IMEs and the types of IMEs. I think the time in the life of the claim, you know, um, is dependent, you know, IMEs are dependent on that as well. And, and the reason for the IME, you know, are we looking at clarification of the diagnosis? Is there an issue around treatment and medical necessity? You know, are we looking for cause of injury? Are there pre-existing conditions and the relatedness that we want to look at? Or are we asking if the person's reached MMI, maximal medical impair and impairment, so improvement? So all of that's there. I will tell you that about three quarters of um, IMEs uh, in the work comp space are orthopedists usually. Yeah, that makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense, Dr. Scheidner. And you know, that, that number aligns with what we see at Best in Class, where, you know, I would say that 60% or so, 60-70% of our consultations are musculoskeletal. Um, really a lot of uh, interest in second opinions in that space. And, um, you know, sort of thinking um, further down the life cycle of the claim, you know, we touched on impairment ratings and um, you know, Paul, I know that you and I have had uh, the, uh, the privilege of sharing a stage together in the past discussing impairment ratings. And, you know, for our audience today, I wanted to just touch on it uh, briefly. Um, what has been your experience with impairment ratings and, you know, whether or not they are correct? You know, what percentage would you say is uh, incorrect? Um, well, Dr. Ben, I think that we have come a long way uh, in the last 10 years, probably the last 20 years. Uh, I can remember early on when impairment ratings were given, and some physicians use the uh, AMA guides, but some physicians use, for example, it was an orthopedic case, they would use the orthopedic guide to evaluation of permanent impairment, and you could get wildly different numbers. I think with the use of the AMA guides, uh, 
particularly if physicians are trained to use them, uh, you should have very little discrepancy uh, in, uh, in the numbers that come up for permanent impairment ratings. And I think part of the problem is that some of the people who are giving permanent impairment uh, opinions are people who are not sufficiently and properly trained in the use of the guides. One of the other problems that we see uh, nationally is that not every state uh, has adopted the most recent version of the guides, the sixth edition. So there's some states that still use the third. And I think the quality of the opinions expressed using the earlier guides is not quite as good as the quality of the opinions being used using the most recent guides. So I think that I, I think there's a number of, of variables uh, that go into uh, getting a good opinion. I think it's the proper use of the guides. I think it's the use of the guides. Uh, and I think with physicians who are properly trained. Yeah, that, that's very helpful, Paul. I think so, you know, three issues really highlighted there. So one is having a physician who's trained in doing the rating the right way, who can reference the AMA guides. I use myself as an example. The first time I was asked to do an impairment, um, you know, before I'd had the opportunity to work with Dr. Chris Brigham, um, you know, I said, of course, the patient has no impairment. I did a great surgery. Why, why would the patient have any impairment? Um, but that's not always the case. Sometimes just by just by having a diagnosis and having surgery, you will have an impairment. So one is training the physicians appropriately. Two is, you know, being in a jurisdiction where, you know, the sort of the up-to-date um, AMA guide is, is referenced. Um, and then also, um, you know, being able to, um, you know, assess the injured worker in the, in the correct way. And so, so that, that all makes sense, Paul. Yeah, I think uh, the issue with, with permanent impairment is that frequently is a proxy for degree of incapacity. And in some instances, there's a direct correlation, but in some instances, there's no correlation at, at all. And so I think you have to be very careful with permanent impairment ratings. Yeah, for sure. And so um, let's drill down on independent medical exams or IMEs. And so um, I want to start by, you know, just polling the panelists, because one of the things that, um, that we have seen uh, or that we've heard uh, best in class is, um, you know, a sentiment that um, IMEs can be often overutilized. And that, that's a, a bit of a controversial stance, depending on how you want to look at it. And so, you know, some people will say that IME is overutilized, and some people will say an IME is very necessary, and even in some cases, maybe underutilized. And so I would love to pull the, the panel here and understand what does everyone think in terms of whether or not it's overutilized. And I'll start with you, Sarah. Spoken like a lawyer, I think the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, you know, depending on the situation, depending on the client, I've certainly seen some situations where clients of mine have gotten an IME every month. Um, and certainly in situations like that, I can say maybe that's overutilized. Maybe that's not necessary in every single case. Um, so sometimes, you know, I can say maybe it's overused. Sometimes I think it's just right. Sometimes it's really telling our story, our side of the case. And I think it's just right. It's it's really perfectly used. Um, so I hate to sound like the lawyer and say it depends, um, but really does depend on the case. It does depend on the situation. It does depend on the client um, and the facts. So I hate to sound like the lawyer, but it depends. Yeah, sometimes it depends is the right answer. Um, what about you, Janice? What What are your thoughts? So let me preface this by saying that I think IMU, IMEs used correctly are extremely valuable. However, that being said, I do believe that IMEs, <clears throat> excuse me, are often overutilized to, to Sarah's point. And I hope none of my none of my cases were the ones she was referring to, but um, they, they are often overutilized in the claims process, and um, they can definitely be valuable tools for providing medical opinions. Their effectiveness can also be diminished when they're over, you know, overused. So over-reliance on IMEs um, can lead to delays in claims, increased costs, and unnecessary strain, strains on the injured workers. So I think it's important to strike a balance and use IMEs judiciously, focusing on cases where additional medical insight is genuinely needed to make informed decisions. Totally agree. Dr. Seidner, do you have anything to add to the overused versus underutilized versus a depends debate. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm right there with uh, with Janice and Sarah. 
era as well. And, you know, I guess the question you should ask yourself is, can you get your issue resolved or your question answered using a different approach um, and application of a different type of expert? Um, and so with that, you have to also consider the quality issue that goes into the IMEs and how good's the opinion that you're getting? Are they actually answering the questions that you put before them? And in that case, uh, you may be able to rely on an expert medical opinion to help resolve any of the questions. Also, peer advisors um, are effective in some cases. And again, it sometimes depends on what's allowed in a specific jurisdiction. Perfect. And what about you, Paul? I'm going to walk in lockstep with the three earlier comments. I, I think Dr. Silas put his fingers right on the issue. Is there a question that needs to be answered medically? And if there's a question that needs to be answered medically, then it makes good sense to have an IME. I can tell you that I uh, I have a history of representing injured workers as well as doing defense work. And I had some physicians uh, who, for one reason or another, would not render causation opinions. Um, they'd be a tr primary treating physician. They were well-trained. They were very good at what they did, but they did not like the get litigation process. And for the life of me, I couldn't get a causation opinion out of them. And so I would request, as, as claimant's counsel, I would request an IME for the sole purpose of getting somebody to answer the question, did this historical event cause the pathology that's presently being treated? And I would get, a, I would get an answer to that question, more often than not, uh, helpful to me. Uh, by an independent medical exam. So that's the the flip side of the coin that we typically see is that more often than not, I think defense counsel and employers and insurers are the people who re request IMEs. But consistent with what everybody else said, I think they have to be used judiciously. You have to remember that these cases come in front of the same judges all the time. And if you are an employer or carrier and they see you asking for IMEs in every single case, whether they're needed or not needed, you're gonna you're gonna do something to adversely impact your reputation before that judge. So you just be careful. That's a, that's a great uh, point, Paul, and um, that's one of the things that we found uh, as a use case for our expert medical opinion services at Best in Class, where you know we have providers who you know will answer some of those questions um, without necessarily needing an IME. So um, really important point. And um, just some points for our audience members. So I do see that uh, a number of you are using the raise your hand feature. Um, so I won't be able to call on you, but I would recommend that you submit your questions or your comments uh, as part of the Q&A feature. And um, I can uh, then uh, you know, mention it uh, live for you. All right, so um, a couple more questions on sort of this idea of when you should use an expert medical opinion. And uh, this is for you, Sarah. So are there specific triggers or events that you think could prompt the need for an IME? So we sort of touched on this, but it really is to tell our side of the story. So sometimes if we see a situation where treatment is just going and going and going and we don't see a stop to it. Or if there's a situation where there's been surgery and we're not seeing the disability getting any better, or there's a situation where somebody remains out of work and that person's remaining out of work and we're seeing no sign in which that person is making any move to get back to work. And another situation which I often see is a great trigger is a fraud situation um, where perhaps you know my client has mountains of vi video surveillance and um, they say, hey, Sarah, I have this video surveillance. Should I get an IME? Should I get some, some um, IME behind that? And then we talk about the timeline and how to use that and work together with how to use the video surveillance and work together with that. So there's often a various amounts of triggers and it's about putting together a timeline, putting together what story we're trying to make here and sort of, you know, understanding what is the ultimate goal here. Is it to talk about treatment? Is it to maybe move the case towards a settlement mind frame? Is it to maybe move the case towards a disallowance if the case uh, mind frame is maybe this accident never occurred? Maybe that's the mind frame we have. So it really is about a big picture and then moving towards that goal. That's very helpful. And 
you know, that's a, that's a, a great transition to, um, to our next slide here in terms of thinking about, you know, the purposes and benefits of um, IMEs and also some of the litigious considerations. And so, um, you know, we know that IMEs can be valuable for both the injured worker as well as the employer carrier. Um, but there are oftentimes that litigious considerations um, or that there are these litigious considerations for both parties involved. And so I want to explore a little bit more about some of the purposes and benefits of an IME. Um, and, you know, one note here is that an IME uh, is, you know, their use can be basically dictated or driven by um, the state. And it can be really a, a lever that has to be pulled by the employer um, or insurer. And so it can be absolutely necessary. But um, we'll explore <clears throat> some of the state-based considerations in comp in uh, some subsequent slides. Um, but I wanted to pose a question to you, Janice, and, um, you know, are there instances where an IME could potentially contribute to a faster resolution of a workers' compensation claim and may actually benefit employees in terms of timely medical treatment and compensation? Absolutely. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we, we use, you know, IMEs is, um, you know, we, we want, we really want a um, objective opinion on the situation in the in the case, and um, you know, using an IME, if if we get a report back that says, you know, this is a case that we owe, um, you know, we that that allows us to make good decisions to you know move that case forward with um, surgery or uh, with resolution. That's very helpful. Um, and and Paul, you know, we we have outlined here sort of the you know, different um, considerations for both the injured worker as well as the employer and carrier. Um, you know, a question that I, I, I have for you, Paul, is how do employers and employees find this balance between the needs of the employer for an accurate medical diagnosis, but then also the rights of the injured worker to have access to the things that they, that they are entitled to? You know, Ben, uh, everyone benefits from a quality evaluation. And so I think having somebody evaluated by a healthcare provider who is um, both straight in the sense that they're going to give you a good, fair uh, reading on what's going on with the person medically, but it's going to make solid recommendations. The injured worker benefits from that, from that as much as the employer and carrier do. So I think if, if an IME is done correctly, now some states, for example, have panels where they use IME docs and they are... Uh, situations where somebody has to request uh, of the uh, state for an appointment of an IME doc, and then the state uh, decides who the IME doc will be. Um, I think in those those situations, uh, the state has a lot of control, but I think you can do that wholly apart from that situation and simply retain the services of a doctor who you know is going to do a couple things. One, do a thorough evaluation. Two, come up with reasonably uh, a, a good reason diagnosis that they can support and then a good course of treatment uh, subsequent to that. So I think that's where everybody benefits. You have to understand workers' compensation is supposed to be a simple, straightforward system where people who are injured at work are compensated for their lost time and treated medically appropriately. And if you have that in mind about this, these, the, the, the system, I think IMEs fit nicely in the treatment being appropriate and timely. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, Dr. Seidner, you know, from the perspective of the insurer, are there legal considerations that um, either an insurer or an employer should be aware of when they decide to pull, pull the lever um, and, and use an IME for a work, workers' compensation case? There are a number. Um, I think, you know, there are statutory issues that we have to think about. Um, the number of IMEs that might be allowed in a specific case. I think you have to think about the time frame for the IME as well. Um, and then other things to consider are claim characteristics. You know, is there litigation going on is the claimant represented or not um, all of these things I think are important and just going back remember you know physicians are exercising their independent clinical judgment in the best interest of the patient 
um, or the individual that they're evaluating. Um, but having said that, you know, with the treating physicians themselves, besides that, I think ethically, besides legally, um, they should be doing something called shared decision making, where the individual is having some say into what treatment they're going to agree to. Now, having said that, obviously, we've got our medical treatment guidelines in many states. Um, and but certain people may choose to avoid surgery. Others may want the surgery. And I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well um, as we're thinking about any of the legal or ethical considerations for the management. That's very helpful. That's very helpful. All right. So, you know, we've talked about, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, how to um, use these IMEs when they're useful. How do we get a, do a successful IME? Some of the feedback that we have received at Best in Class is that there's significant variability in the quality of IME reports that clients receive. And, you know, some of this is in the top box here. Um, and, you know, these are just some of the um, things that we have been reported back to us where they've been described as pain points currently in the industry for quality of IME. And, you know, Paul touched on the on the first point. And, you know, I, I'm a little bit biased in that, in that, um, you know, I trained at a, a place where, you know, physicians did a number of IMEs. And, you know, sometimes, um, you know, the physician would not really spend as much time doing the IME as they should. And, um, or it was done by a physician ass assistant, et cetera. And, you know, these are things that really bothered me, you know, that I saw during training. And, you know, it's net things now that are being reported um, back to us at Best in Class as, as current issues with IMEs. And so, um, you know, our goal is to ensure that, you know, truly the best quality physician is doing the IME, um, that they are doing an, a comprehensive exam and they have all of the information available and that the requester of the IME is uh, getting and answering, uh, getting the questions that they, they want answered and uh, thinking of the right question. And so I would love to get your sense um, from the panel here, uh, some of these issues and uh, some of the ways that we can help to address them. And so uh, for you, Janice, my question would be, you know, what quality assurance measures are in place or can we put in place to ensure the reliability and objectivity of IME reports? You know, um, I, I agree with everything you have here on the slide. And um, the first being selecting the best examiner. You know, we we really do want an independent medical examiner. Um, you know, it's important to be very judicious when selecting who your IME is going to be. Um, we prioritize individuals who demonstrate thorough, thoroughness and objectivity in their assessments. And it's essential that these examiners are highly respected, which, um, you know, in their jurisdiction, especially by the judges. Um, you know, we, we definitely don't want to have any kind of perception out there of bias or partiality or, you know, the other phrase, the hired gun. You know, we, we truly want an independent medical examination. We want, we, you know, we don't want to hire somebody who's going to say whatever they think we want to hear. We want, we want an objective review so that we know which direction the claim needs to go in. Um, and then the second piece you, you touched on as well, which is the correct questioning. You know, it's, it's critical that our adjusters ask the right questions. They need to get with their attorneys and um, formulate good questions. Uh, many times the effectiveness of an IME hinges on whether or not um, the examiner addresses the right issues and uh, clarifying the scope and objective of what we want from the IME beforehand also I think can significantly enhance the usefulness of the uh, to the claims process. That, that's great. That's great. I think that that's very helpful uh, feedback and um, you know, speaking of questions, um, I encourage our audience to submit questions. Uh, I see some people raising their hands still. Um, Paul, did, did you have something that you wanted to add there? Yeah, I would like to add to Janice's uh, comment about the appropriateness of the questions and the directness of the questions. The IME examiner, on the flip side of that coin, is give good answers. Think about the question that's been asked. What are they really trying to get at here? and appropriately answer the question. I've seen a number of IMEs over the course of my career where the doctor really didn't answer the question that was posed, but rather got off on a tangent asking something else. 
I agree again in her comments about objectivity. One of the one of my responsibilities when I was a state regulator is that I supervised all the judges, and I would meet with them every six weeks. We would talk about caseloads, but we would also talk about what was going on. And I can remember a discussion once where they talked about a IME doc who was used frequently. He wrote incredible reports. He was uh, incredibly well trained, but he was as biased as you could possibly imagine. And what they said they would do is they would read the report up to the conclusions and they would rip that page off uh, and draw their own conclusions from what he had found on physical examination, what he took for, by way of a history. So that was a really stinging indictment for me. And it was something that the insurance people should have been really sensitive to because they were using this fellow on a regular basis and his opinions were not being subscribed to at all by the judges. They knew he was a hired gun. And just to echo what Janice and Paul are saying, you know, a successful IME also isn't just a report. These doctors have to often stand by these reports in depositions and testimony. So to have a really deep understanding of the case and these theories and these medical theories and understandings of what they're saying and, you know, assessing of these injured workers is so important and not somebody who's going to be rushing through reports just to get to a conclusion on paper. Um, you know, the best IMEs are the doctors that will take their time through the report and then really stand by their conclusions during testimony. They're amazing IME doctors um, and they really make all the difference in, in testimony and in hard cases, so. That, that's a good, good add on. Um, Dr. Seidner, um, you know, IMEs, we, we've touched on the fact that IMEs are oftentimes used to move the case forward, get to expedient resolution. Are there, um, you know, strategies inclusive of IMEs that you find are effective ensuring a, in ensuring a fair and uh, expedient resolution of a claim? Absolutely. I think, you know, we need to, and I'll use the term, multimodal claim management. So there's many levers that can be addressed in helping resolve claims. So what is the issue? Um, a lot of times, you know, it's all about communication. Um, so yes, you know, we want to make sure the IME is independent. We want to make sure they have quality reports, as been mentioned. I, I would add in, you know, that we want to select IMEs that have been properly trained and are up to date on all the medical and understand the specific issues um, about the workplace as well as the claimant nuances. All of that's important, but we can also add in our own claim specialists. So are we having more of a return to work focus? Are we really focused on maximizing overall function for the individual? Or are we just looking, you know, some way to resolve the claim. And there's specialists that look at all of these a little bit differently. So I think having a multimodal claim management strategy is critical. And we just say, you know, around the key for communication, um, if there are some states that make it difficult to have communication with treating physicians. And so I'll say there's, those are states, and I'll use the term ex parte, you know, there's no ex parte communication allowed in some states. And so that's a challenge because if you don't have good communication, that's an obstacle. And I think if you look closely in those states, you're going to have more um, conflict, more questions, and more tendency for utilization of IMEs. Thank you, Dr. Seidner. <clears throat> that was very helpful. So um, it seems like we've we've stimulated questions from our audience. And so um, you know, I think one of them is, um, two of them actually are germane to the conversation before we move on to the next section of um, the, the, the webinar. So um, one of the questions is, can you speak to retired physicians doing IMEs and how that might impact a good report? And I have a good answer for this, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it up to the panelists to, uh, to, to, to take a first crack at it. Paul, how about how about you 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 take it? You have a big I, smile there. Yeah, well, I dealt with that issue uh, in my state. And the question that I posed um, when I dealt with the legislature on the issue is, um, if a physician is working on a full-time basis uh, up until today, uh, and tomorrow he starts working or she starts working as an IME doc, do you think they've forgotten everything that they know about medicine uh, the next day? And I think the answer to that 
is retirement um, is okay as long as they're not retired for too long. And I see where some jurisdictions allow people to be retired for three years, they uh, for for two years or whatever. So I think it's a matter of how 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 close to retirement are they asking being asked to do an IME, and are they keeping up with the medical literature to support the fact that they're aware of what's going on uh, in medicine? So I don't have a real problem with retirement as long as it's not somebody who's been out of the game for an extended period of time. Yeah, that that I I love that answer. And to borrow uh, the the terminology from Sarah, it depends. Um, <laughs> and you know, I think that that's sort of what you're getting at, Paul. Is that um, you know, if the retired physician is keeping up with the medical literature, um, if they are someone who you know was previously a giant in the field, um, and you know they are spending the appropriate amount of time and they're doing comprehensive you know evaluation. Um, you know, they can uh, certainly be char okay to do an IME. You know, I will tell you that, you know, our bias at Best in Class ND is towards having uh, practicing physicians um, do the IMEs because, um, you know, those are physicians who tend to be, not always, but tend to stay more abreast of the literature. And we do other things to make sure that the physicians in our network are, um, you know, people who are, um, you know, clinically rigorous. Um, any other thoughts on, on that question before I uh, uh, discuss the next question? I would just say during the cross-examination, the injured worker's attorney would just go after the fact that you are just the hired hand. So you'd have to just prepare that doctor with the breadth of knowledge that that doctor has for the many years practicing, how well up to date that doctor keeps with you know, the literature and everything else, because I've seen it come time and time again that they just go after that fact that all you do is IMEs at this point. Okay, so I'm still, a, I've been a doctor for so many years. That doesn't take away that. Um, so they they go after that. And it's quite annoying. Um, so I, you know, I always try to prepare the doctors with be prepared for this. They will go after that point. Um, so you have to make sure that they're very well aware of that to expect that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. Um, this is more of a comment than a question, but um, thank you, Joanna Lipinski, for submitting this. So I have encountered issues with patients who were ordered to attend IMEs and were still just recovering from their surgeries and not cleared by the surgeon for PTOT. Um, in many cases, it would appear that the IME provider and medical providers should be communicating on their clinical findings. And so, you know, I think this is more of a comment to um, as to break down in communication between the, the care path and probably speaks to the earlier comment where um, IMEs may be overutilized to just learn more about what's going on in the case and, you know, ordered so that, um, you know, the, the claims management team can understand if someone is, is cleared or, or not. And so uh, move on to the, to the next section here. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the state-based considerations um, in um, workers' comp. And so uh, this is a graphic that we put together uh, best in class, and it, it really uh, speaks to um, the breakdown of employer versus employee-directed care um, in the U.S. And so the employee-directed states are in, um, you know, the orange ish color and the employer directed uh, color uh, states are in the blue color. And so you can see that, you know, not only is the claims management process complex because of all the things that we've talked about in terms of, you know, provider training, provider quality, um, questions that are being asked in, in, in you know, inaccurate or incomplete um, data, but there's also, you know, state-based rules to consider. You know, Dr. Seidner touched on some of this where, you know, in some states you have a limit on the number of state of number of uh, IMEs or second opinions <clears throat> that you can request, and so um, you know, sort of the big one that we find is um, you know whether or not um, the employer or employee can direct care once an injury has occurred, and so um, just um, let's touch on on this um, you know employer versus employee um, driven um, care direction model for a second. Um, and so I'll kick off this discussion with with, with you, Paul. Um, is there any data around this breakdown of employee versus employer directed care? And um, if so, how does the quality of the care provided under you know these various models um, compare? That's a great question, Ben. And the answer is there's not a great deal of data. However, WCRI, and I have to admit I'm a fan of WCRI, 
uh, it's a think tank from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, they did a study uh, in 2005 with the California Policy Institute looking at that very issue. And I think the essence of the report is uh, injured workers who have a right to choose uh, end up costing a little bit more for their medical treatment. They do not return to work as quickly, but they're very happy with their treatment. Contrast with that, when an employer chooses the, the uh, provider, uh, they, they, it costs less, uh, not markedly so, but it costs less. Um, the return to work is more quick, uh, but the injured worker is not happy with his, with his or her treatment. And so there's almost like an attitude. If I'm being told to go to this doctor, I'm not going to like the doctor. And I don't think that that's a particularly uh, fair attitude. Yeah. The, the, the question, too, Ben, uh, is very difficult to answer in black and white terms, in large part because, uh, for example, the state of Maine is an employer choice, but it's an initial employer choice. After 10 days, the injured worker has a right to choose a physician that they want to see. There's other jurisdictions that have similar time frames. Initially, it's an employer choice, but after 30 days, the, uh, the injured worker can, can choose to go to somebody else. The data on that, however, suggests that once an injured worker starts treating with somebody, they typically don't change treatment providers very often. Uh, they end up staying with the doctor that they're assigned to. Uh, so that's, that's about the only data that's available. I don't think anybody else has looked at that, but it's a very interesting question. I think the introduction of utilization review, the introduction of fee schedules, has had an impact on that too, because this was this study was done in 2005. Fee schedules in some jurisdictions didn't come in until the 2010, 2015 period. So I think fee schedules would impact on the result of that study if it was done today. Yeah, that that that's very helpful, and you know I think that um, you know an, uh, definitely an opportunity for for research. And um, you know, Dr. Seidner, I'm very happy if you take this that research question back to the Hartford to study it. And would love to be a co-author with you on that publication. But um, I do have a separate question for you, which is, you know, the, clearly there are differences in, um, you know, jurisdictional differences in um, the type of providers that injured workers have access to. And so um, how does the choice of care provider impact the employee's experience of the workers' compensation process? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times the employee are already under the care or have a relationship with a primary care physician. So if they go to their primary care doctor for the work-related injury, you know, and the doctor really isn't familiar with the work comp system or rarely really takes care of people with work comp injuries or illnesses, that can be a problem. Um, there's certain forms, paperwork that needs to be sent in, certain communication that should occur that isn't the same as the normal under the group health. Um, and so all of that is, is critical to keep in mind that, you know, this, this flow of information, as I mentioned, the communication is critical. Um, also things to think about in these states are, is it a managed care state? And what does that mean? And, or is it a monopolistic state where, you know, the government basically is running um, everything in that state? I think the other things to look at is, do we have networks in that state and what kind of networks, you know, so does the employer have an opportunity to set up their own network? Is it something that the um, insurance company may have? And do we have a broad network or a very narrow network? Um, you know, is there a specialty network? So I think looking at the type of networks in these states make a, a big difference as well regarding the type and the quality of treatment. And then finally, I'll add in, you know, we are in a period of time where we have physician shortages and it's not just in state, but, you know, a state might be look OK, but in certain counties, that's a problem. And so is there an opportunity then to start leveraging technology when there is, you know, an area without the proper treating physician so that a teleconsult can occur where there's an assistance to that treating physician with a more qualified expert? All of these things. I think uh, we need to bring in into um, consideration. And just to add on to what Paul said, if people want to see, there's been some, and I, I like WCRI and all the great work they're doing as well. 
they have some publications that come out called CompScope, CompScope Benchmarks. And if you look at that, you can start looking at the different litigation rates and how much, you know, maybe going toward IMEs in a specific state as well. Um, and then there's other states that do their own reports, such as Oregon and also New York. So all of that is, is out there for people to take a look at, and you can draw your own conclusions from that research. Thank you, Dr. Seidner. That was an excellent answer. And, um, you know, now that there's been two plugs for WCRI, I also am a fan of WCRI. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to uh, attending the meeting uh, first week in March. Um, you know, you touched on an interesting point there, Dr. Seidner, and there's actually two questions in the Q&A box on this. And it seems like it's a bit of a, a burning issue, which is the idea of um, physician shortages or, you know, also known as medical deserts. And, you know, the idea of a medical desert is that, you know, there are areas in the U.S. where residents have very limited access to healthcare services and top tier providers where, you know, even, you know, states like California or Florida, where per capita, it may seem that there are a number of appropriately qualified physicians. But when, when you drill down to, you know, the county level, et cetera, um, it can be really difficult to get access to a top tier provider. And so, um, you know, Janice, I'm going to pose it to you. How do large multi-state employers or carriers think about, you know, this idea of a medical desert as it relates to access um, for the employees and uh, access to expert medical opinions? You know, as everyone's mentioned, it's definitely um, a difficult issue, and I really think it's much bigger than people give it credit for. Um, but, a, a, you know, addressing the challenge of medical deserts really has to be kind of a, a multifaceted approach because there's not one single way that, that um, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can um, fix the issue. So first I'd say, you know, working with local health systems and, you know, trying to increase their local footprint. Um, you know, oftentimes these local health systems are, are actively trying to recruit doctors, you know, to areas that just, you know, are, are not desirable, I think, for, for doctors to live in. And um, it, it seems like the easiest and most logical solution, but it's still difficult for those health systems to be able to get doctors to relocate. Um, another option that that we've tried using is leveraging um, retail clinics. You know, CVS, Walmart, you know, uh, other um, retailers are now um, because of access to care. You know, they're having they're they're uh, putting clinics inside of their uh, retail establishments. So that's another another route that you can go. Um, there is a little bit of difficulty there because they aren't at this current time readily wanting to take workers' compensation to because of some of the issues you I think. Uh, I, one, somebody mentioned earlier, as far as, you know, the paperwork that's involved and, you know, the reporting that's involved, it's, it's just a whole nother business that they, you know, aren't typically um, willing to get into. Um, telehealth has been brought up and that's a potential solution that we've, we've used to kind of bridge that gap, um, you know, from forcing injured workers to have to drive an hour to get to the closest care. Um, I, I would, I would say that um, another thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, you really have to address the shortages at a granular level. To your point earlier, um, you know, it may look like the state of Texas and the state of California have plenty of doctors, but when you get to these very rural areas, you know, that's where the it, that's where you really run into the issues. And and you know, there it might again seem like there's enough doctors, but they're not taking new patients. They won't take work comp. So access to care is is really an issue in some of these places. Yeah, that's great. And, um, you know, I, I would, I'll comment on the, um, you know, telehealth option of it, you know, at best in class, we've been playing, you know, doing our role to address, um, you know, these medical deserts and employee uh, physician shortage issues um, through telehealth. You know, some examples of things that we do is, you know, we'll connect a local treating provider to, you know, BICND expert where we can um, provide um, education, training around, um, you know, the diagnosis, the treatment, we also connect directly to the employee or injured worker um, for a video visit um, to really start to get at some of the things that Dr. Seidner had mentioned earlier with the shared decision making. Um, and, you know, with telehealth, the data has been showing that, um, you know, physicians that you spend longer in a telehealth encounter than they do um, with an in-person encounter. Um, and, you know, that's mm -hmm. a really great way to 
um, break down the uh, traditional uh, physician silos. And um, Sarah, I saw you nodding your head there. Yeah, What's even in New York, mind? even in New York yeah. and New Jersey, there's rural areas. Um, and, you know, the telehealth space has really been blowing up, particularly in the mental health areas um because with mental health a lot of that therapy is talk therapy um so you know the facetime the telehealth all of that um has been expanding and that's been very helpful particularly in the rural the rural areas in new jersey and new york and for the first time in the last couple of years i've had more employers looking into the ppo area of things um so that's involved involving you know getting more um, providers that are highly specialized, um, that are maybe a little more expensive, but bringing them to specific areas and really fast tracking injured workers to them. Um, so we're having more employers looking at that, that avenue as well. But the telehealth is really expanding. And I remember the uh, the board in New York was issuing some um, literature a couple of years ago about it, and it really didn't gain much traction a couple of years ago. But now it's really, it's really expanding. And thankfully for the, you know, the places in upstate New York and some places in New Jersey has been quite helpful. Yeah, that's very helpful, Sarah. <clears throat> and I, I think this slide and this conversation has stimulated a number of questions. We have uh, various comments and questions um, in the box. And, and so um, I'm going to go ahead and read some of them now. Um, so uh, three comments from uh, Peter Strauss. So thank you for, thank you, Peter. Um, very insightful. So um, he, he gave Paul some kudos. So he said, Paul is right. Be careful about the designation of employee or employer choice. Many states identify the initial choice one way, but permit continued care to be directed by the other choice. So thank you, Peter, for that. And then Peter went on to say there is also a prior WCRI study. That's the fourth plug for WCRI. Um, and he said maybe done in 1995. Um, it was done by Peter Barth. And that indicates that employee choice states have longer durations and higher costs and about 85% satisfaction with medical treatment. While um, in employer choice states, that study found lower costs, shorter durations, and about 83% of injured workers were satisfied with their medical treatment. So um, I think the, the flavor of that comment might be that um, employer choice states lead to better outcomes and lower costs, but um, I'm sure a number of confounders potentially in that. Um, there is a question that's that I'm not sure we have the answer to, but it's a great question nonetheless. Um, is there more litigation in states where care is employer directed? Intuitively, I would say yes, but does anyone have any thoughts or um, comments on that? I don't think there's any data on that, uh, Dr. Ben. I'm, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with anybody who's ever looked at that issue. I'd love to know. I would say, you know, we we are in New York and we are in New Jersey. And I can say my gut feeling is, for me, it's easier to settle cases in New York than in New Jersey. So take that for what, for what it is. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, and uh, a question from, well, really more of a comment from um, two comments. Uh, Joanna Lipinski, access to healthcare is a huge factor in many rural regions. And then uh, Tina D'Andrea asked, uh, would it be possible to get a copy of this map? So I'll take that as kudos that uh, the BICMD team did a good job on putting together this map. So thank you for that comment. And, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us and we can share not only the map, but the research um, around the map. And so, you know, let's let's move on. So, um, you know, we have a, a couple of things that I, I wanted to get to. Um, so, you know, as you can see, there are restrictions on second opinion services by state. And, you know, these we uh, leaned on the resources that have been published by WCRI. And um, this, this particular table is from uh, a, a publication in 2022. And, you know, this specific table shows that there are different considerations for states where um, you know, you know, we traditionally at BICND will see a high volume of workers' compensation claims. And, you know, in looking at the audience attendees, we do have audience members from all 50 states. Um, but, um, you know, there are very specific considerations for, you know, different states. And so um, wanted to focus on New York and New Jersey. 20% of our audience members are from New York and New Jersey. 
And, you know, I really wanted to highlight that even though these two states are in close proximity, they can feel a world apart. And so, Sarah, I know you touched on this a little bit, but can you um, share your experience from Jones & Jones in terms of the perspective of having, um, you know, work in New York and New Jersey, two states that are right next to each other, but yet so different? Yes, yes. So New Jersey, of course, um, the employer can direct care. New York employee can direct care. Um, so in New York, we get IMEs quite a bit. Um, we get it, like I said before, to tell the story of treatment, too much, too little, to get somebody back to work, um, to move impairment rating, to move something towards permanency. In New Jersey, because the employer directs care, oftentimes the IMEs are less. Um, the IMEs are not needed as much. Uh, the IMEs really are for impairment ratings and for very little else. Um, so there's a big difference there. But like I said before, my perspective is it's a lot more difficult to settle cases in New Jersey. And my perspective really is because the doctors really move the cases in New Jersey. They really run the show. Um, and they direct care. Uh, they they really, you know, run the show, and that's what it is in New Jersey. So when we do get IMEs in New Jersey, it's super important, and we really want to make sure that they tell the whole story. They really run the full assessment of the injured worker, and we put our best one forward. That, that that's very helpful um, context, and I know we're coming up on time, so. Um, wanted to pose, um, you know, the last question, depending on, um, you know, the time that we have um, to Janice. And so, um, you know, we talked about some of these factors of selecting, um, you know, the um, second opinion provider. What would you say, um, you know, how does the selection of a second opinion provider impact the decision making uh, process for a claim? So I, I would say it you know, a second opinion provider significantly influences the decision-making um, process for a claim. It's, it's critical for us to be able to ensure um, the accuracy and the completeness of the initial di diagnosis and treatment plan. Um, and I, I feel like a well-chosen second opinion provider can bring fresh insights and expertise to the table, um, offering an independent assessment and helps really validate the, uh, the initial findings or, um, or challenge the findings. Um, I think the process enhances the quality of decision making for um, for our adjusters, and ultimately, I, I think it contributes to better outcomes for the injured for the injured associate, um, ensuring that they receive the most appropriate care and support through their through their recovery. Great, great. Well, thank you, Janice. So, um, three fifty nine. So, coming up in the hour, I wanted to leave it open to our panelists here to see if there were any parting words of advice or our thoughts that you all have on, you know, our topic here, which is, you know, when to use an expert medical opinion um, versus uh, using an independent medical exam. Or even a records review, Dr. Ben. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And, you know, look, I, I would say that I've learned a lot um, in this past hour um, you know, we, we learned <clears throat> about some of the state-based considerations. Uh, we got the perspectives um, um, both from legal counsel and from, you know, a large insurer, a um, large employer. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we, we have uh, had the fortune of doing at Best in Class is <clears throat> moving the conversation forward and um, serving the needs of our clients. And I think that, you know, we showed today that there is opportunity to um, you know, navigate between when to use an expert medical opinion, a regular record review, or an independent medical exam. <clears throat> and it's a question of, you know, knowing when to pull that right lever. Um, and so wanted to end by thanking the panelists for, um, you know, giving us their time today. Um, very honored and uh, privileged to have them as part of our panel. Wanted to thank our audience members um, for uh, signing up and participating, um, submitting excellent questions. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them, but feel, do feel free to email us um, and we can uh, get to the questions um, uh, asynchronously via email. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.